What's up, Rocky? We are so glad you're here. Whether you're joining online or here on site, we're going to sing out to Jesus with all that we got. So here we go. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Come on, let's sing these words out. Here we go. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine search the world. I search the world. But it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise, the treasures that fail are never Every desire. 
desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, let's sing this together. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Man, what good words. Don't miss those. Here we go. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for our sake. You turn shame into glory. You're the sing a song about how God is the God of the impossible. He's the over the impossible in your life, in my life, and so today we sing this out as a prayer to him right now. Come on. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you. Sing this out, come on, here we go. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are, because you are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here.
make these next words our prayer. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Come on, pray this together. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Sing it out. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. One more time. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Oh yeah, church. Man, if you're in the rooms at either this campus or the Niwa campus, you can take a seat. If you're online, man, we're just so glad that you're with us today. And I, I just want to encourage all of us. I, I think that message is what we need to hear. That Jesus is a way maker. Man, in the midst of our darkness, he's a way maker, a promise keeper. Man, he's a light in the darkness. I had quite a few people say to me over the past few months, man, 2020 has been the worst year ever. Yeah, amen, right? I would also say this, though. Sometimes we look back in hindsight and see all the things that God was doing in the midst of our darkest times. And it may be a time where we just need to remember that Jesus is a way maker, that he is ahead of us, he is in front of us, he's working on our behalf, and he might be doing some things in us right now that are going to make us better for the future. I know that's difficult sometimes in the midst of the pain, but Jesus is there. We need to remember that. I want us to take an opportunity, John chapter 14, verse 6, it says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And one thing we do every single week to celebrate just who Jesus is and what He's done for us is we take the Lord's Supper, take a little piece of bread, and we take some juice, and we take that remembering. Jesus said on the night before He died, sitting with His closest friends, His disciples, He said, every time you gather, every time the church gathers in the future, I want you to do this, remembering that I'm a way maker. And I've done that through the cross and through the resurrection. So right now, just wherever you are, if you're in the room or you're online, I just encourage you to take that little piece of bread and take that right now, remembering that it represents Jesus' body that was sacrificed on the cross for us. And then when you're finished, take the juice and drink that. And just remember that it represents Christ's blood that was sacrificed the life in the blood. Jesus says that he substituted his life for ours so he right received the punishment that we deserve for our sins so that no longer would there be a chasm between us and God, but that God would reconnect us with himself through Jesus, Jesus the way maker. So as you take communion, why don't we just take about 30 seconds wherever you're sitting right now and let's just take a moment to recognize Jesus, his sacrifice, and thank him for his gift of grace. And then we'll pray together as three campuses in a minute.
all three campuses, wherever you're sitting, let's just bow and pray. And Jesus, we just recognize right now that when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to our faith, you are the way maker. You're the one who made it possible. And so we thank you for your sacrifice, for loving us enough to enter into our broken world, to experience our brokenness, and then to save us from it. And so, Father, I pray today for those who are sitting here today saying, I'm in the midst of some brokenness and some difficulty. I pray that as we go through the message today, that they will be re-encouraged to reconnect with you, that you might give a light to a pathway out of their brokenness. Father, we just love you and we thank you for Jesus. Bless us today. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, Rocky, I am super excited about today. We should be in the sixth week of our series on Revelation called The Dragon in the Room, but... We decided Revelation was just such a huge topic and going through it for nine weeks straight, we were like, hey, we probably should just take a break in the middle. And even with all the circumstances of our world and things going on, it'd be great to take a break and get a guest speaker to come in. And we've invited, I'm super excited about this, uh, Jeremy Jernigan, who is a great friend of mine. Jeremy and I have known each other for four years. Um, We've been in a pastor's group, about seven of us that meet two times a year. Been in that group for about three years together. And I've just so enjoyed... Uh, Jeremy and his leadership and who he is as a person. And here's what I say about him. Jeremy is a deep, deep thinker. Like if you are looking for a book to read, Jeremy has authored two books, one for church leaders and then also just for people who are investigating faith. He has a book that's called Redeeming Pleasure. And if you want to think deeply about how the gospel intersects faith and how it intersects social issues of the day, man, that is a book that you want to read. But what I love about Jeremy is he's not just a deep thinker. He is a deep thinker who takes his faith and puts it into action and thinks deeply about how it affects our world. And so Jeremy and his wife, Michelle, they've been married for 15 years. They've got five kids. Two of those are adopted ki- adoptive kids. And it is amazing to see how they are just reaching into the issues of the day and applying the gospel and thinking deeply about that. And so I think you're going to be encouraged today. So why don't you just help me out today, all three campuses, and give a huge round of applause for Jeremy as he comes to speak for us today. Well, it is so great to be with you guys. I love this church. Uh, I love Sean. Uh, like he said, we, uh, we go back four years ago where I got to meet him over a ping pong game. And you find out a lot about someone when you play uh, ping pong with them. And let's just say it didn't go well for Sean when we met. Uh, I felt a little bit bad about how bad I beat him. And so uh, this trip, he's like, hey, uh, I got a ping pong table. Why don't, why don't you come out? And so I'll be like, I'll bring my paddle. You know, So I bring my paddle out and uh, he smoked me the first two games that we played. And I thought, I don't know what you've been doing saying you're you know, running a church, but I think all you're doing is playing ping pong. Uh, but thankfully we played six games, so that worked out in my favor. But uh, I love Sean. What I love about Sean, uh, and, and again, if you know him, you know this, Sean just like exudes the fruit of the Spirit. So like that should be a prerequisite, you know, to lead a church. Uh, you, you meet a lot of churches, a lot of people, you go, that, you don't really look like Jesus a lot. Uh, Sean does. And every setting I've ever seen him in, I'm like, you just look like Jesus. So I, I just love uh, the chance to be with you guys. Uh, the fact that you get to be led by someone like that is an incredible blessing for you. And it's an honor for me to get to share uh, a little bit of my story today. If you got your Bibles, I want to encourage you to get those out, uh, whichever campus you're on. Uh, so glad that you're here. We're going to go to John chapter 4. I want to show you an incredible story that has meant a lot to me this year. And while you're turning there, I want to share a story about my childhood. Uh, When I was growing up, uh, I got certain assigned uh, tasks that I was going to do. And one of them was to go grocery shopping with my mom. And I would push the shopping cart. And I was kind of the man of the house. Uh, I would go with her, you know, and my dad would send me like, all right, you got to watch over mom. You take the shopping cart. And and as I was, you know, blossoming into a man, that that was like a a role of mine. I took it very seriously. How do I help my mom? How do I be the guy and, and really do this for her? So I would push the shopping cart around and, you know, I, I believed in this role. And I never remember, uh, I'll never forget one time we were in the store. We'd already loaded up our cart with uh, quite a few things. And the, the weirdest thing happened. I'm, I'm pushing a cart. My mom's in front of me. Her back's to me. She's walking. And all of a sudden, out of like the corner of my eye, I see an older woman take something out of my cart and go running. Now, I had no paradigm of how to process this. Like, Did that just happen? You know, it was like one of those, like, did I just see a woman take something out of my shopping cart? Like, did that really just happen? And so I'm so stunned, I just keep walking, I don't say anything. You know, I'm like, 
There's no way that just really just happened. I, I, I got to be imagining it. We round a corner, and from another side, same woman comes, grabs something out, and disappears like a ninja. And I'm like, what is happening right now? And so I'm thinking, okay, Jeremy, don't bring your mom into this. You got to solve this problem. You got to figure out what is going on. And as I'm processing and pushing the car, I got nothing. Like nothing has prepared me for why would a woman be taking items out of my shopping cart? I just can't figure this out. And so finally I keep walking. I kid you not, this lady comes back a third time, takes something else out of my shopping cart and vanishes. And now I'm like, I, I got to say something. So I'm like, hey mom, stop. She turns around. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. This is, I know this is going to be a little bit weird. There is a lady that keeps coming in and taking things out of our shopping cart. My mom looks at me, she looks at our shopping cart, and she goes, Jeremy, that's not our cart. <laughs> oh, well th- yeah, that would make some sense then. Uh, so I literally leave the cart with this lady's stuff for her. You know, she thinks I'm stealing it. You ever have one of those moments where you think you know what's going on, and then you realize, Oh, wait, I I was totally seeing that the wrong way. Uh, That's what I want to do today in John chapter 4. I want to show you a story that for my entire life, I've grown up in the church. I've read this story. I've heard this story. I was convinced I knew what it meant. And this year, Jesus just showed me something totally brand new. And I can't wait to share it with you because it has meant so much to me. And if this could be an encouragement to you, that would be awesome. So we're going to get John chapter 4. And I want to show you a different take on this story. Now, again, if you uh, have grown up in the church or you've read this story a lot, you probably go, Oh, I know all about the story. I want to show you some things that I've learned about it this year, and maybe they will be an encouragement for you uh, to at least consider it. And so we're going to read John chapter 4 together, beginning in verse 1. It says this, Jesus knew that the Pharisees has heard, had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and he returned to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Now, John is a master storyteller here, and he's setting up the scene for us. But you have to know a few details to understand uh, the, the tension that John is creating here. You have the Jews, Jesus is a Jew, his disciples are Jews, going into Samaria. Now, this is like two rival enemies happening here. And and a lot of us, we go, what's the big deal? We don't understand the Jews and Samaritans. So let me give you a brief summary. What was a Samaritan? Well, there's four things that the Samaritans believed. Uh, You could say these were the the pillars, the creed that they were built upon. Okay, and I'll, I'll read these quickly. They had one God, which was Yahweh, one book, which was the Torah, one place of worship, which was Mount Gerizim, and one prophet, which was Moses, okay? So these four things, you could say that is what it meant to be a Samaritan. Now, by contrast, if you were Jewish in that day, the first two, you probably would have agreed with. You'd be like, yeah, I'm good with those. But the second two, three and four, you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mount Gerizim is not the place of worship, and there's more than just Moses as our prophet. So that is where they split. Now, to us today, if we don't understand this, we're going, what's the big deal? They look pretty similar. Uh, You know, if they got half of them right, I don't understand why they're they're at odds together. So let me give you a modern day example uh, that might help you understand this. I want you to think rivalries. I want you to think of, you know, people who don't like each other. And you really have to go to sports to get a great flavor of this, of, of, okay, two teams that hate each other. Think like the Broncos and the Patriots, right? Like you just go, oh, yeah, those two teams. Now, I happen to be a diehard baseball fan, and my team are, are the New York Yankees. No reaction. I usually get a reaction one way or another. So just get it out. Go ahead. Get it. Okay. All right. So the New York Yankees, like, and I'm not just like a little bit of a fan. Like, I've named all five of my kids have Yankee middle names. Okay. That's the level we're at. Uh, we, we like them a lot. Now, if you know baseball, you know the Yankees have a rival in the Boston Red Sox. And some have said this is the greatest rivalry in all of sports. Okay. So if you don't follow baseball, maybe you don't know that. It's a pretty intense rivalry. So much so that if you get me talking about baseball, as a Yankee fan, I cannot help but react whenever I meet a Red Sox fan. And I say things that I would never say in any other setting because I'm polite and, you know, I can control myself. But if you get me talking about baseball and the Red Sox, things just happen. Like sometimes uh, someone will say, you know what, I like the Yankees and the Red Sox. 
To which I'll say, oh, you don't follow baseball. Because you can't like the Yankees and the Red Sox. You're a casual fan at best if you say you like both those teams because that's not how that works. Or when someone says, hey, I'm a Red Sox fan, immediately, I can't even stop it coming out of my mouth. I'll always say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And look at me like, what? I'm like, I, I don't know where that came from. You know, it's like, I just can't, I, I met Ron on your staff. Uh, he tells me he's a Red Sox fan. I'm like, I'm so sorry to hear that. He's like, what? I'm like, I don't know. I'm sorry. It just comes out of me. I cannot help it. But there's something about this rivalry. It just invites you into it. Now, here's what's interesting. If you put me in a room, just me and a Red Sox fan, okay, we got lots to disagree upon. I mean, we're going to go back and forth and the rivalry and this and that. It can be for hours. But if you put me in a room with me and a football fan who doesn't like baseball, I will have less in common with the football fan, no matter what team they root for, than I do with a Red Sox fan. Why? Because at least the Red Sox fan got the sport right. They know baseball is the greatest sport. But they got, you know, some other things wrong. And that doesn't mean we get along. It makes the rivalry heightened. That's a good way of understanding the Samaritans and the Jews. They're not polar opposites. It's not like they have... Everything, you know, is, is not in common. They're on the same sport, but that rivalry intensifies on the specifics of what they're arguing. So Jesus, uh, so to use my analogy here, Jesus is the Yankee fan, right, uh, coming into Red Sox territory. Okay, just humor me a little bit. He's walking in. So you have to understand, John is setting up a hostile situation. The Jews are walking into Samaria, and everyone's going, oh, man. How is this going to play out? And then you get to a really interesting detail that John drops in the story, not by accident. And I think this is the detail that we tend to overlook and why we don't maybe see what John wants us to see. Notice verse 5. We already read it, but let me go back and show it to you. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Do you see the huge clue in that verse? Now, most of you are like, I don't see anything. This guy's losing his mind. What's the huge clue in, in verse 5? He, John is introducing another person into this story. And, and you might say it's a silent witness to the story because the person is dead. Now, let me connect this back to the Old Testament to you. If you go to Joshua chapter 24, verse 32 says this. The bones of Joseph, which the Israelites had brought along with them when they left Egypt were buried at Shechem in the plot of land Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor for 100 pieces of silver. That's the same spot that John 4 is taking place. So what John is doing is he's introducing the bones of Joseph into this story. And you may be going, well, why does that matter? Well, if you know the story of Joseph, this begins in Genesis 37. Joseph goes on an incredible journey of ups and downs and all kinds of pain on his way to experiencing uh, what God ultimately has for him. And, and we're going to see some parallels here. And so John is introducing Joseph into the story. Now, if you know the story of Joseph, I want that to be, like, bring that into your mind. Because that's what John is, is queuing us up with as we read John chapter 4. And if you don't, I'll illustrate a few things in the story of Joseph so that you can see what John might be doing as he tells us uh, the story of John chapter 4. So let's go back to John 4, and we'll read verse 7. Soon a Samaritan woman, a Red Sox fan, came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. They hate each other. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons, remember Joseph, and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. 
But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. And here's where we wish the story ends, because it's about to get weird. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, this story is, is poetic up until that last part, and you're like, ooh, that got awkward. Uh, Jesus knows some interesting details about this woman's life, uh, and then we begin to form all of our conclusions around it. Now, most of the way that we explain it, we focus on the time of day that this story takes place. It takes place at noon. Well, noon in that setting would not be the ideal time to go and draw water. It would be incredibly hot. That is not when you want to go do this. Why is she coming at noon? It's likely that she wants to get away from the people in the village. She doesn't want to be with them. She's probably marginalized from her community. Now, the question is, why is she marginalized? What has she done uh, to, to create that where she feels alone, where she feels like she can't go uh, to the well the same time they do? Now, the way I was always raised, the way I've always thought of it, is that she was an overly sinful woman, right? I mean, she had been married all these times, she had all these spouses, and she's living with this guy, and, and we just create this narrative about her, like, well, when you screw up that many times in your life, that's what happens, and, and you're, you're the outcast, and, and all of this. And yeah, as I began to study this more this year, I don't think that's the most compelling explanation to what we find in the text here. I don't think that is the most logical way to interpret this story. And so I want to offer a different way. They go, okay, well, how, how should we view her situation? Because she had five husbands. Well, we have to use our imagination here because we don't know why she had five husbands. Jesus doesn't tell us that. It could be that uh, a number of her husbands had passed away and she had outlived them. It could be that they were unfaithful to her and they left her. But what I think is the most compelling reason, and this might seem a little strange at first, I think it likely that this woman was unable to have children. And that was the reason why she had five husbands and was living with a man who was not her husband. Now you're going, whoa, whoa, whoa that's bizarre. Why, why would you think that it all stemmed on that? One of the things you have to realize about this culture was that women could not initiate a divorce. It wasn't up to them. So culturally today, we read our, like, oh yeah, if you're a woman, you can initiate a divorce. In that culture, you couldn't. It was all based on the guy's preference. And we know this because we have the Old Testament. We can read what it, their culture was built upon. For example, let's look at Deuteronomy 24 and, and just notice these verses in light of John chapter 4. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. Just let that language sit there, right? Whoa. She does not please him. Having discovered something wrong with her, he writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. When she leaves his house, she is free to marry another man. But if the second husband also turns against her, writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away, or if he dies, the first husband may not marry her again. Why? For she has been defiled. Now, that's hard for a lot of us to even read that today and go, whoa. But that was the culture this woman in John chapter 4 is, is living in. And so something had happened for five different husbands to choose to leave her because she didn't have the rights to do that. This was, we blame her initially in the story. That wasn't the culture. She couldn't have initiated a divorce. It would have to have been a husband. How could five husbands find something wrong with her and keep moving on? Right, you go, how could that be? We go, okay, oh, what about, you know, she's living with a guy and it's not her husband. And we go, oh, that's bad news, right? And, and we immediately go to, this must be premarital sex. I mean, this is bad. That's why Jesus is so mad about it. But again, notice the text doesn't say that. And so we go, well, why is she living with someone? Maybe it's an extended family member that she's living with. Maybe she has to find some situation for her own survival, that is not ideal at all, but it's the only way she can make it. So she has to live with some guy that isn't her husband. We don't know why she, she's, uh, you know, living with this guy. So I think in all of this, we got to realize is we, we, we want to really blame her and go, she did all these things wrong. But I don't think that's what's happening. 
I think what Jesus is looking at and why he's saying all this to her, I think he's saying, look, I know your story. I know your pain. I know what you have been through, and I see it. There's something so powerful when you realize that Jesus looks at us, not just for the success, not for the things that you've done well, not for your finest moments, but at your worst, at the hardest parts, at the the pain we bring, and he sees us there. The author Parker Palmer says this, the human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed exactly as it is. Jesus is witnessing this woman. He is seeing her in all of her pain. He's saying, I know, I know. And this would be right in line with the story of Joseph. And if you read the story of Joseph, one of the sentences you see woven throughout that story, it keeps saying, and God was with him, and God was with him, and God was with him, even as it goes from bad to worse to even worse. And God was with him, and God was with him. Because Jesus sees our pain. He knows what we're going through. And I think here Jesus is going, I, I, I see your story. I see your pain. I'm aware of all of it. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, you, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? Why, we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship. She's talking about the third uh, of that fourfold creed. This is uh, uh, discussion number three. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Uh, We read this, we're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. To them, it would have been like, point three doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you worship in Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem, it's irrelevant. That's like saying, hey, uh, it doesn't matter if you cheer for the Red Sox or the Yankees. It doesn't matter if you're a Broncos fan or a Patriots fan. It doesn't matter. We're like, whoa. It matters. And just going, it's not going to matter. And you begin to realize, like, this is a huge shift taking place. Uh, and this woman's going, I'm sorry, it's not going to matter anymore? And you can just imagine her processing this. Verse 22. You Samaritans, he says, know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, well, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Can you imagine that moment? She just ponders this reality. Could this really be? This guy we have waited so long for, this guy's gonna change everything. Could I really be talking to him right now? I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well. Take note of that. Why was she there? To get water. She leaves her jar there. Uh, She has uh, found something far better and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Now, why do I think that the traditional way we've viewed this isn't the most compelling way? Because if this were an overly sinful woman who had a laundry list of sins and she comes running out to tell a village, come see a man that has told me everything I've ever done, what would their reaction be? Hey, look, Karen, we all know what you've done, okay? Everybody in the town knows what you've done, who you've been with, we got your story, we're not interested uh, in, in hearing about that. That would not have been a compelling reason for the entire town to come running. But what about this? What if she was marked by depression her entire life or as long as they had known her? Because all she knew was pain. All she knew was rejection. All she knew was being on the outside of what everyone else seemed to be experiencing. And and that had left a mark on her. 
And they knew her as the depressed woman. That's who she is. She's had a rough life. Uh, Steer clear of her because she'll just bring you down with what she's got. But for the first time, they see joy on her face. They go, what has happened to her? What could possibly turn this woman, who all we've ever known of her was depression, what could possibly turn her into a joyful person? We have got to see that. See, something had happened that the entire town wants to be a part of. The pastor, Judah Smith, says this about this story. Remember, she was at the well in the blazing heat of the noon sun. This was to avoid people and not be seen. But she left seeking people, the ones she had been avoiding. What just happened? Something had transformed inside of this woman. Something had shifted. And the town goes, we've got to see it. We've got to see what could bring joy to a person like that. If you jump down to verse 39, it says this. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but also because we have heard him ourselves, and now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. If you go back to Genesis, and you read the story of Joseph, you find that God was with Joseph in pain after pain after pain, rejection after rejection, after betrayal and hurt and all of this. God was with him. And if you get to the end of the story, God uses all of that in Joseph's life to bring healing to all the people around him. Could it be that that's the same theme in this story? That God had used not an overly sinful woman, a woman who had been so hurt, so discarded by the world, and God says, I'm going to use you to bring healing to this entire village. Could this be a story about how God works in the very worst of our pain, the very worst of our struggles? It says, watch what I can do. So the question I have for you, wherever you're at today, however you're uh, watching this, what pain have you experienced in your life? What do you bring with you? Because we all got pain. It may be pain from your childhood. Like, oh, let me tell you what happened to me when I was a kid. Maybe pain from a more recent time. Maybe it's pain of this year. A lot of pain in this year. What pain did you bring with you here today? And you go, this is my pain. Because here's my encouragement to you today when you think about your pain. And I encourage you to write this down if you want to take notes here. Pain takes on purpose when given to Jesus. So you have a choice. When you realize this is the pain I'm bringing, and all of us have got pain. If you've lived long enough, you get pain. Pain takes on a purpose when given to Jesus. You can either hold on to it and decide that's just my pain. I'm going to sit on this, and there is no purpose to it. Or you can open your hands. You can give that pain to Jesus. Acknowledge that Jesus is aware of it. He sees it. And you can invite Jesus to bring healing to you and to others in the midst of your pain. Now, if I could be vulnerable with you for a moment. This has been the most painful year of my life. Uh, we went out to Oregon. Uh, we, we were following what God had, uh, you know, set out for us. Uh, that was three years ago. We knew this is going to be an incredible trajectory. It did not play out the way we thought. And we had to walk away from something that we had felt so clearly, God, you asked us to do this. And we moved back to Arizona this year. And I have asked all kinds of questions. What was the point of that? Why would you allow this? Why didn't you step in? What is going on here as we sit in that pain, as we process this, as we experience the letdown and the rejection and the betrayal and the frustration, all the emotions that come through that? And the choice for me is the same as the choice for her, is the same as the choice for you. Do I just hold on to this pain? Do I bury it? Do I pretend like I'm tough enough? I'm smart enough? I'm strong enough, I'll take care of it? Or do I get real and go, God, this is my pain. And I want to see what you can do with my pain. I want to invite you in. Because I believe that pain takes on a purpose when it's given to Jesus. And it becomes a story of healing. And I want you to note, when this woman has this happy ending and the village comes running to see it, 
Notice that her story didn't change. She doesn't suddenly have a husband. She's not suddenly pregnant. It didn't resolve the way she may have wanted. And some of us, we're going, when my situation resolves, then I'll experience joy. Then I'll invite Jesus in. And you're missing it. Because the invitation for all of us is to experience joy right now in the midst of whatever you're going through. Not when it resolves someday. See, we like talking about pain in the past tense. Let me tell you what I went through. Let me tell you how I healed through it, how I got beyond it. It's far harder to say, no, I'm in it. And it hurts. And I don't understand, and I don't. And that's my story right now. I don't understand. I don't get it yet. And yet I believe this message to my core that pain takes on a purpose when it's given to Jesus. And what God did in the story of Joseph and what God did in the story of the Samaritan woman is the same thing that God wants to do in your life today, in my life today. If we will let him in, let him witness us fully and see it. I wanna close with a quote from a woman named Stephanie Sparkles. This is a woman battling cancer. When I say battling cancer, I mean present tense battling. Not I got over it and it's resolved and it's all great now because that's a different perspective. But the perspective of I'm right in the middle of it. I don't know where this goes. And yet in the midst of this journey, here's the words that she has to say and we'll close with this. I love when people that have been through hell walk out of the flames carrying buckets of water for those still consumed by fire. How could Jesus use your pain and my pain to bring healing to the people around us? Let's pray together. Well, Jesus, we're in awe of how you work in stories like this. We're in awe of how you used the life of Joseph the way you did of how you use the Samaritan woman in John chapter four, how you see us, you witness us as we truly are, not at our best, not at our strongest, at our weakest, at the hurts, at the pain that we carry. You know it, you see it and you are there. And you invite us to let you in, to invite you to redeem it, to take that pain and not necessarily resolve it the way we may want, but to use it for your glory, to use it for healing, not just for us, but for healing those around us. God, we know this world needs to be healed. This world is broken. This world is hurting. And what would happen in, in a church like this if you were to use our pain for the benefit of those around us? How would you heal these communities? How would you heal these families? How would you heal this world around us with people like us who brought our pain to you and said, this is what we've got and allowed you to do what only you can do? God, that is what we wanna see. May the story of Joseph, may the story of the Samaritan woman continue in our lives today. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming, Jeremy, Sweet. and sharing with us. Been awesome. Appreciate your vulnerability and, uh, man, a timely message in a crazy, crazy year. Also, who knew that uh, a Yankees fan could preach so well? It's awesome. <laughs> uh, but hey, I'll all, be praying for you. Yeah, man. thanks, buddy. For you. Thanks, buddy. Hey, all of our campus right now, give Jeremy some love. Oh, thanks again so for being here, man. It's awesome. Just a couple of quick things. First, if there was something in the message today to just uh, kind of rang pretty loud in your heart and your mind, and you would love somebody to, to chat with you or to pray with you, uh, I want to let you know right now, you can actually text Rocky Prayer, all one word, and leave a space, and you can put in your prayer request. You can uh, text that, send it in to the number 97000. We'll get that. And uh, as a church staff, we would love to be praying uh, with you. Niwot Campus, Fred Campus, right after service, our prayer team will be right down front. Feel free to come and connect uh, with them. Uh, two other quick things. One, you can always go to our website, rocky.church slash this week. There's two big things happening uh, or coming up. Uh, the first one is we are right in the middle of a fall clothing drive. We launched this last Sunday and uh, we're looking for new and used clothing to help out men and women in our community who could uh, use something warm to wear. You know, we always are a church asking the question, how can we help? And this fall, uh, this is one of the practical ways we can do that. So all the information's on our website. You guys have killed it this past week. You've come and dropped off so many uh, bags of clothes. It's been amazing, but we're going to continue on with the drive all 
all the way till November 22nd, so you still have some time. We'd love you to participate with that. Uh, and then secondly, we've got a, a baptism celebration Sunday coming up on December 13th. And so if you are a follower of Jesus uh, and have not taken the step of baptism, I couldn't think of a better Sunday for you to go public with your faith. Again, more information on our website. You can register there, uh, but we would love to celebrate with you as you take that next step. Uh, man, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Go home, take a nap, watch some football, and we'll see you next week as we continue on with the dragon in the room. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.